for, for me, the key idea was basically I could get my own types. And that's the idea that goes further into C++, where I can get uh, better types and more flexible types and more efficient types. But it's still the fundamental idea. When I want to write a program, I want to write it with my types that is appropriate to my problem uh, and under the constraints that I'm under with hardware, software, environment, etc. And that, that's, that's the key idea. People picked up on the class hierarchies and the virtual functions and the inheritance, and that was only part of it. It was an interesting and major part, and still a major part in a lot of graphic stuff. But it was not the most fundamental. It, it was when you wanted to relate one type to another, you don't want them all to be independent. The, the classical example is that you don't actually want to write uh, city simulation with vehicles, where you say, well, if it's a bicycle, uh, write the code for turning a bicycle to the left. If it's a normal car, turn right the normal car way. If it's a fire engine, turn right the fire engine way. Da 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 da. -da. You get these big case statements. And bunches of if statements and such. Instead, you, you tell the, uh, the, the, the base class uh, that uh, sets the vehicle and say, turn, turn left the way you want to. The, the problem with operator overloading back when it was first implemented was that a lot of people in the C++ community then felt deeply victimized because there were a lot of people who would use operator load, overloading incredibly inappropriately. Because if there's only like a dozen operators that you can overload. And, and so if you want to do something that doesn't semantically match one of those dozen, over, dozen operators, right? So you're, you're used to thinking of, you know, less and less and greater than, greater than a shift operators. Okay, they're shift operators. And plus and minus mean add and subtract. They don't mean like list insert and list remove or output to file and input from file. So, um, and, and this probably is because of a, there was a large project at Sun that died horribly where people had gotten really, really out of control using operator overloading in wildly inappropriate ways. Um, and those people had knives and access to my office. Um, and, you know, so I was convinced that, eh, well, until somebody came up with a better idea, you know, the, you know ways to, and, 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 I, and I still still have that issue with operator overloading. The, the, but the problem is that operator overloading is so freaking useful for things where it is appropriate that it sort of ought to be there. Guy Steele, in a sort of separate direction, did, did an operator overloading implementation, not on the, well, it's on the JVM, but he basically allowed any operator class character from all of Unicode to be operator overloaded. And the problem with that was that nobody could figure out what circle with a squiggle over top of it meant, right? You know, it's, it, it ends up being deeply in, inscrutable. And, and so it's like, okay, so it makes a lot of sense for people who do math, um, which sometimes includes me, and I really like the idea of having operator overloading. Um, but uh, it, it, it just food fight after food fight. One of the things, and I, I mostly got this from my mentors who taught me programming language design in the earlier 80s. When you're teaching programming, the, the total newbie who has not coded before, in, not in any other language, a whole bunch of concepts in programming are very alien or sort of new and maybe very interesting, but also distracting and confusing. And there are many different things you have to learn. You have to... In a typical 13-week programming course, you have to, it's re like really learning to program from scratch. You have to cover algorithms, you have to cover data structures, you have to cover syntax, you have to cover variables, loops, functions, recursion, classes, expressions, operators. There are so many concepts. If you can spend a little less time having to worry about the syntax, the, the classic example was often, oh, the compiler complains every time I put a semicolon in the wrong place or I forget to put a semicolon. Uh, Python doesn't have semicolons in that sense, so you can't forget them. And you are also not misled into putting them where they don't belong because you don't learn about them in the first place. But there are bad problems in committees. It's inevitable because you get... Um, Conflicts of personality and conflicts of style and, and sort of deep, uh, deeply held beliefs that aren't fully unpacked into chains of reasoning. It's hard to reason together uh, if people come from really different uh, schools of thought. So we've learned how to cope with this by not rushing to any conclusion. When you're doing language design, you're solving many problems which... Sometimes you have to throw things out and start over again. That's happened, for instance, with uh, ES6 proxies. Uh, you have to avoid the temptation to say, well, I have developers that are solving this complex um, compound problem, so I'm just going to give them a complex compound solution that's kind of a fixed composite function, because that usually doesn't work. It's usually the case that when you decompose it, you find that you've got uncomposable parts. And what we'd rather do is what the scheme, scheme in the browser, the scheme uh, report says in its very first paragraph, it says, break the language down into orthogonal primitives that work well together. So that's been the job of the committee, and coming to an understanding of those primitives and minimizing the choice of the keys. 